Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. As this stark summary reminds us, two of Henry VIII's six wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, were executed for treason. The position of a woman at the heart of the male-dominated Tudor court was frequently a precarious one. On intimate terms with the most powerful man in the realm, they could be suspected of being manipulative or untrustworthy. It is perhaps not surprising that both women were brought down by lurid allegations of sexual intrigue. And it all started very differently. After his marriage to Anne Boleyn in 1533, Henry VIII changed the law to protect her. It became treason to declare that his ex-wife Catherine of Aragon was still queen. In 1534, the first act of succession made it treason to slander his marriage to Anne. But Henry was desperate for a male heir, and Anne failed to provide him with one. If Anne lost the king's favour, it wouldn't be long before powerful enemies at court, not least the king's chief minister Thomas Cromwell, would move against her. On 24th of April 1536, special investigations, known as commissions of Oyer and Termina, were established in Middlesex and Kent to investigate allegations of treason against the Queen. It was said that she had committed adultery with five men, three gentlemen of the King's Privy Chamber, Henry Norris, William Brereton and Francis Weston, the musician Mark Smeaton and, most scandalously of all, her own brother, George Boleyn, Lord Rochford. The Queen had lured him with her tongue in the said George's mouth, ran the indictment, and the said George's tongue in hers, with their eyes wide open. The times and places of these alleged liaisons were also given. In another document, we find the supposed motive, Anne's frail and carnal sexual appetites. Being accused of cuckolding the king was bad enough, but for a treason charge to stick, strong evidence had to be produced that Anne wished him dead. Accordingly, she was accused of using her sexual influence over the men to imagine the king's death and promising to marry one of them after he had died. Defendants in a Tudor treason trial were at an enormous disadvantage. They were not allowed legal counsel and weren't even informed of the specific charges against them until the day of the trial. Norris, Brereton, Weston and Smeaton were tried together in Westminster Hall on Friday the 12th of May. Only Smeaton pleaded guilty, and then, only to adultery, he denied wishing the king harm. But it was enough to damn them all. They were sentenced to the traitor's death of hanging, drawing and quartering. Anne and her brother stood trial three days later in the Great Hall of the Tower of London. Despite her dignified rebuttal of all charges, the conviction of her supposed suitors meant that Anne's trial was lost before it had even begun. The jury of peers unanimously found her guilty and the Lord Steward of the Court, the Duke of Norfolk, Anne's uncle, proclaimed sentence. Because thou has offended our sovereign, the king's grace, in committing treason against his person, and here attainted of the same, the law of the realm is this, that thou has deserved death, and thy judgment is this, that thou shall be burned here within the Tower of London, on the green, else to have thy head smitten off, as the king's pleasure shall be further known of the same. The judgment prompted a bemused murmur among the judges because it offered the king a choice of punishments, which was most irregular. The king opted for death by the sword for Anne in the French style. The English favoured the axe, and an executioner was summoned from Calais to perform the act. The warrant for Anne's execution claims that Henry, moved to pity, chose death by beheading to spare his queen the indignity of burning and grant her a swift death. By the still extant 1534 Act of Succession, all who had accused Anne were guilty of treason, so the law had to be hastily rewritten to pardon them. A new Succession Act of 1536 denounced and confirmed Anne's treasons. Four years later, having lost one wife, Jane Seymour, to death from complications after childbirth, and divorced another, Anne of Cleves, Henry VIII married Catherine Howard. Catherine was still a teenager, 
but her past made her vulnerable. She had been abused by her tutor Henry Mannox, and in 1538 had received Henry Deerham and another man in her bedchamber. Deerham left for Ireland shortly thereafter, describing Catherine as his wife. By the time he returned, she was married to the king, and Deerham demanded a position at court. Another courtier, Thomas Culpepper, used his knowledge of Catherine's past to secure private meetings with her. We can't be sure if she agreed to them willingly or under the threat of blackmail. What we do know is that she hadn't told Henry about any of this. In October 1541, word reached Archbishop Cranmer, who told the king. Under questioning, Mannix and Deerham both admitted to having relationships with Catherine. It was enough for Henry, who turned his back on his new wife and never saw her again. Catherine confirmed her connection with the two men, but insisted that they had aggressively pursued her and that nothing had happened after she married the king. When Deerham's evidence implicated Culpepper, Catherine insisted that, once again, the man had been the aggressor. The meetings with Culpepper had been arranged by Lady Rochford, the widow of George Boleyn, who had been executed for treason along with his sister Anne. And Lady Rochford believed that the liaison was sexual. Culpepper, however, while admitting that he intended to do ill with the Queen, claimed that he had been unsuccessful. But that made little difference in law. Even to attempt to violate the King's consort was, according to the Statute of 1352, a treasonous act. By the end of November, Catherine had been stripped of her royal status. Culpepper and Deerham were convicted of treason for endangering the King and the royal succession. Culpepper was beheaded and Deerham hanged, drawn and quartered. Others who had known about the Queen's past but not spoken of it were rounded up and questioned. Indicted for misprision or concealment of treason, they were eventually pardoned. But Henry could not forgive Catherine for what he saw as her great betrayal. Early in 1542, a Bill of Attainder was introduced in Parliament, condemning Catherine Howard and Lady Rochford for high treason. The King gave his assent by letters patent on 11th of February, and the women were beheaded, in the English style, two days later. The bill stipulated that in future, if any queen failed to disclose any unchaste past, then they would be guilty of treason, and any others who remained silent would be guilty of misprision of treason. Neither Anne Boleyn nor Catherine Howard presented any real threat to the king. The worst they had been guilty of was human frailty. They failed in what was then thought to be a queen's duty to her king, to provide a son for his succession or a virgin for his bed. And they paid for it with their lives.